Epilepsy is one of the most common disorders of the nervous system. It affects people of all ages, races, and ethnic backgrounds. If you have epilepsy, you require special attention and expert care. Epilepsy and Seizure Care Specialist is one of today's TMJ4's leading medical practices. Our world-renowned doctors are devoted to all aspects of treating epilepsy. This video will introduce you to the most experienced team you'll find. Epilepsy and Seizure Care Specialist is a dedicated group of practitioners whose job it is to treat epilepsy throughout an individual's life with prompt and thorough evaluations and the most advanced care possible. Epilepsy is not a devastating illness when we treat it appropriately. Epilepsy is not an illness involved with shaking, but in fact a much more comprehensive and complex series of manifestations. They require special treatment, they require appropriate treatment, but epilepsy is an illness that occurs throughout life and it requires special approaches to each of those stages of life. It is complex because it is such a lifetime-like illness, but we have established protocols, and you can see those protocols on our website, so that you as a patient or a practitioner can actually utilize those protocols. They meet national standards and they outline how epilepsy care should be approached. Those are important for everyone to follow to optimize someone's care in this somewhat complicated illness. I've had epilepsy since I was uh, six. It began as what was known as Doug's Dizzy Spells, uh, absence epilepsy. I added uh, three different forms as I aged. The, um, it wasn't formally diagnosed as epilepsy until I was eight. Um, in the course of my therapy, I've had uh, every drug that's uh, commercially available, several experimental drugs. I saw many different neurologists, and ultimately Dr. Morris took over the case. And because of the way he handled it, uh, when he finally moved to St. Luke's, I followed with him. He started me on the Keppra medication, and that completely changed things around. The absent seizures, if I have them at all, now they're so minor I don't even notice them, the uh, tonic-clonic seizure, which is the form most people think of epilepsy, I haven't had one of those in several years. And the, uh, ab the um, auras, I have those three or four a month, but those are ones that most people wouldn't even recognize if they saw them be incurred. And the uh, complex partial seizure, I still have one or two of those a month, but that is a big reduction from what it used to be. Ryan, seizures are usually from five to 10 seconds long. He has multiple ones during the day and everything. It affects him in many ways. He can be riding his bike and have a seizure. As he's, he keeps his balance, he veers off the road a little bit when he's having it. He can have them when he's swimming. He can have them multiple times crossing a street. You can't leave him cross the street on his own because he'll have a seizure possibly as he crosses and he'll stop in his track. So they affect him in many, many different ways. Kids are not simply little adults. While um, seizures occur very, very commonly at the extremes of life, in infancy and you know, beyond the age of 65, um, the, the way that children with seizures present is quite different than the way that adults present. Um, children, um, the first event that's usually witnessed by a family member is often a convulsive event. It's a very, very terrifying um, apparent life-threatening occurrence. It's occurrence, the seizure's occurrence, necessitates very, very prompt and competent evaluation. First and foremost, because even though it's rare, oftentimes the cause of that initial convulsion could be something that, if not treated immediately, could be life-threatening, such as meningitis, encephalitis, the results of a recent head injury, um, metabolic disturbances, drug overdoses. About 40 to 50 percent of children who have one seizure will not have a second. Only when they have a second untriggered, unprovoked seizure do we define the state of epilepsy, recurrent unprovoked seizures. When a child has her second unprovoked seizure, the risk of the third is about 80 percent. It's at that point in time we need to consider the pros and cons of treating. Once we believe that the child is at risk for recurrent unprovoked seizures, we embark upon a very careful um, process of evaluation that includes neuroimaging, and that means 
obtaining a CAT scan acutely, but preferably an MRI, and not just any MRI. Not all MRIs are equal. It's important to have the proper recipe worked upon by the radiologist and the neurologist to determine what you're looking for within that brain. It's important to have an EEG, and not just any old EEG, a good EEG with proper application of electrodes so you get the information you want by somebody working close, closely with the epilepsy specialist. We classify the person's epilepsy based upon the EEG characteristics, the imaging characteristics, and the clinical features of the seizure. It's important to classify seizures into various groups because that allows us to select the best treatments. There are a lot of issues very specific to women in epilepsy, and if you go through their lifespan or different life stages, there are issues specific to puberty, uh, issues specific to trying to conceive or have a child or just having had a child and ways that you could minimize the risk of breakthrough seizures after giving birth. Um, and there are issues related to going through menopause that are really just specific to women or women are more likely to um, be impacted by. Uh, and so a lot of what I do and what uh, my partners do is try to educate uh, women about those issues specific to the life stage and minimize the likelihood that they're going to have breakthrough seizures because of a predictable hormonal change or, or change that occurs because of the um, stage of life that they're in. Of course, the first thing that people will try are uh, medications. Okay, what we know unfortunately with medications is there's something called the law of diminishing returns, meaning after the first couple of medicines, the likelihood of being seizure free decreases then dramatically and unfortunately. Um, so we really need to turn and consider other treatment options and two of the ones that we go to quite frequently are something called the vagus nerve stimulator, which is an implanted device similar to a pacemaker, typically placed on, on the left side of the chest. It's quite thin, it's about um, half a centimeter in uh, width. Um, and in addition to that pace device, there's actually a cable that attaches to the vagus nerve, a, ne a nerve that goes into the neck and then into the brain. Um, and that is a device that in 40 or 50 percent of patients, there is a response to uh, in terms of seizure control over time. Vagal nerve stimulator has been um, very beneficial to Ryan for the fact that it has made his seizures less severe. Um, he used to have seizures like every 15, in 15 minutes he'd have three or four seizures at a time and they were more severe. Now he has them less frequent and they're less severe. <laughs> we wouldn't trust anybody else but Dr. Inglis, right? He's the best. <laughs> He's still not going to do it. <laughs> One of the most unique aspects of our program is awake brain surgery in which we're able to map functions of the brain uh, and localize them specific to specific points. Uh, the, the surgery is done with the patient um, uh, asleep for most of the surgery, but then we do wake them up to do uh, what we call functional mapping. And during this part of the operation, we're able to localize where language is, where movement of the hand, the face, the arm, and the leg, and so forth. In this way, we're able to find the area of seizure as well as important areas of the brain uh, that involve function, and we're able to very carefully take out only that part of the brain that is diseased and leave the very important functional part of the brain. Um, this unique aspect r truly keep, um, places us at the level of other world-class institutions. The additional aspects of awake brain surgery is the ability that we're able to resect brain tumors that are located in critical and functional cortex. Uh, both Dr. Morris and I are very well experienced in being able to take out brain tumors in these locations. One of the things that we can do is continuously examine the patient while we're taking out the brain tumor, and in this way, we're able to take out uh, the mo as much brain tumor as possible and minimize um, any risk of loss of function. One of the great benefits of surgical treatment for epilepsy is unlike uh, medications which patients have to take every day for the rest of their lives, um, a surgical treatment can potentially offer uh, a lifelong benefit and get them seizure free. So much of our job I really think is educating the patient and really making them aware of 
what their disease is, what they can expect, how they could hopefully be in better control of the disease. One great aspect that we can offer our patients, especially patients who are very intractable, and by intractable they're, they're very difficult to treat. They have been evaluated and probably failed surgery. Um, they have a vagal nerve stimulator and they're still having seizures and they've been on every drug that we can offer them that the FDA has approved. Well, by offering them a clinical research trial, we create an avenue where they can have uh, or participate in a trial for, with a drug that is not yet approved by the FDA, but it's something they've never tried. So once again, it's, it's another avenue that we can offer to the patients. For a site to become a clinical trial site, um, it's because our office and our physicians are known nationwide as being experts in the field. And they know that the site itself conducts very clean and accurate clinical trials. Another avenue that um, we offer our patients is a patient education series. And it's offered the third Monday of the month, every other month. And these are topics that are down to earth for the patients and it deals with their disease and maybe some comorbid factors of their disease, depression, sleep problems. So we try to offer things to the patients that are going to help them with their everyday lives. Visit our website to learn more about our practice and services. Discover the support and quality care you've been looking for. To schedule an appointment, call us at 414-385-8688. Epilepsy and Seizure Care Specialists, the right care for your life.